and beginning a new year. And I think the book that we are going to look at today is very appropriate because it was written and inspired at the end of an era, at a very important time in the history of Israel. It's at the time of the captivity. Most of the prophets in earlier years have been prophesied about a coming judgment when they would be taken unless they would repent and return to the Lord. But they did not return to the Lord. So in Ezekiel's time, he went into captivity with them. And uh, so his message is very applicable. As I mentioned many, many times in the previous uh, series on the prophets, the message of the prophets of the Old Testament match the New Testament. It's the same message. God never changed his message, never changed his method and his solutions as well. The only difference is that Jesus Christ came and we live after Jesus, but the, this message is, is remains the same. So let's look at verse number one, chapter number one. And we will see the beginning of, of this, the time and location and who was Ezekiel to, to bring up uh, all together. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, fifth day of the month, I was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal. The heavens were open and I saw visions of God. So the book of Ezekiel starts with visions of God, with really something. It's like the book of Acts of the Old Testament, the supernatural, miraculous. Uh, you remember in the book of Acts in chapter 8, where Philip was taken by the Spirit somewhere? Ezekiel was taken by the Spirit in Jerusalem. He was taken by the Spirit among the captives. We don't know how God can do something like this, but we know. So it starts with vision of God. So on the the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. So we know very precisely when this second captivity came. There was three movements, it's just a bit like uh, the Cultural Revolution, like there were many movements in it. So in these deportations, there were three movements. The first one, uh, many, many tens of thousands of exiles, uh, including Daniel, was was young, was taken to Babylon. The second one was this one where Ezekiel himself and many others were taken. Ezekiel was also a priest and he was taken, it says, in the fifth year of the exile of King Yoyakin. So it's been already five years after this second deportation when the call of God came strong. The Holy Spirit, the vision came on him. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Chebar Canal. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So we know already many things about this. So he was among the captives uh, 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. So we have a, a gap of 10 years by the time they were taken in captivity. And then we see that uh, uh, we have five years later, he was about 30 years old and still in captivity. God called Ezekiel into service as a prophet roughly about six years just before the destruction. So he was taken 10 years before the, the destructions, but six years within that period of time, God called him as the text that we have uh, read. And it says, the hand of the Lord was uh, upon him. And this is an expression to tell us that the movement of God, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, the, the supernatural inspiration of God was on him. The power of God was working through him to bring this message. So it's a very, very special time. It comes, as I said, at the end of an era. At the end of all of these years of God's patience and forbearance when God sent over and over and over and over again these prophets with a message, repent, I want you to live, I don't want to destroy you, repent and live and receive the blessing of God. But they were stubborn and it came to that point in time. So I think it's very appropriate for us because for two reasons. First one, we are at the end of a year. 
and opening. And usually it's a time where we examine ourselves. We look at our past year and we analyze some of the things that we enjoy and some of the things we wish we would have done differently. And also with our walk, especially with our walk with the Lord. And then we also, the second thing is that we are at the end of an era as well. And the and the time of the end times, we will say, when Jesus is coming soon. And I hope that you believe by what you see happening in the world and by what the scriptures tell us. So the message of Ezekiel is very, very appropriate for our generation, for our time, for our time and the year, but our, our time and the uh, being living and the, the end times. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 14 and 17 the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And this is an expression that you will see repeated uh, five or six times throughout the books, where the Spirit comes upon him so, so supernaturally, miraculously, where he is lifted and he is carried somewhere and given a message and then he is, is speaking. And then he says in verse 15 that he came to the exiles, the Spirit moved him there, and he received his calling, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. And then a watchman, when I will give you a word of warning, you better give this word of warning. And this is still a commission to us. You know in the Great Commission, this is the same thing as the Great Commission. He was commissioned to be a watchman. We are commissioned by the Lord. In my name, Luke chapter 24, repentance and forgiveness of sin shall be preached among all the nations. Go ye therefore into all the nations and preach, baptize, make disciples. This is the same thing. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we have received the ministry of reconciliation. We have been reconciled. We have now been appointed as ambassadors of Christ. It's the equivalent of this. We have a special mission of and being intermediate between the, our king, our leader, and the, the people who need a message of reconciliation. So this has not changed. What Ezekiel is called to do, we are also called to do in our generation as well. So Ezekiel was commissioned to act as a watchman. In this book, the most important theme is the, what I'm going to, 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 to tell you. Remember years ago when we did the training on inductive Bible study? We learned to observe the context of a book, look for key words, key expressions that would uh, tell us uh, the, the theme, like w what really the message was about, the intention of the writer, who is writing, the recipients, and the key words, the expression. So here in this book, there is one expression that comes back 61 times. And 48 chapters, it is written, mentioned in 27 of these ch 48 chapters. So that is very abundant, as you can see. And it is listed in the following, in the following slide. God wants us to know that He is the Lord. And this is the, the theme. W to keep in mind one, one truth about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a priest. Before he is a prophet, he was called as a prophet or a watchman, he was a priest. So his, his role before God is very much aware, he's very concerned for the holiness of, of the Lord. And we, we learn here that in the midst of punishment, when they were even in captivity, God was, has not abandoned them. God was working out a plan uh, to change them, to bring them back to them. And after God's intervention, and we read in many, many of these scriptures, I only list a few of them here, that people will know that the Lord is God. And this is what God wants us to know because we see uh, in, in this text, uh, the prophet and the priest Ezekiel is very concerned for a lack of holiness. He, and we will come back to this theme a little bit uh, later. Uh, here, the question is, do you know the Lord as He wants to be known? 
because all of us we have a religious background we've been coming to church maybe you've been in lighthouse for uh, 20 or uh, 20 years or five years or you've been uh, raised in the Christian environment or Catholic or traditional Christianity in the past and you have been brought up with religious concept about God a lot of facts about God I knew a lot of things about God when I was raised in my place we were uh, in a Catholic environment and my school uh, and church and my family we we have learned a lot of things about God a lot of concept a lot of truth and facts about God that we already knew but I didn't know the Lord at all I didn't know God. I didn't know His holiness. I didn't know His hatred of sin. I didn't understand the righteousness, the concept of righteousness. I didn't understand uh, expiations, the, the why Jesus had to die for sins. I didn't know what sin meant to God and what sin did then to my life. I didn't know that, but I knew many things about God, you see? So, and, and this book here, one truth that is coming almost in every chapter of this book is that God wants to display His holiness. He wants the, all the people to know. And we read in Philippians chapter 2, because I like to make connections between Old Testament prophets and New Testament. One day, every knee will bow. Every mouth will confess that Jesus is God. And that is when the glory of the Lord will, will be, will be re revealed. Ezekiel's message and his emphasis is, Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And this applies very, very much for us today. So do you know God and His holiness? Do you have a fear of the Lord? Do you understand your life the plan of God, uh, the, uh, how, what sin has done to you, what God has in His heart for you. Do you have these kind of things? As I mentioned before, Ezekiel as a priest is very, very concerned for holiness, the holiness of the Lord. Being a priest, he will have a lot of symbols, a lot of instructions, and a lot of visions that regards the priesthood, the future temples, requirements of the priests, their clothes, their way to approach God. We will see a, a lot of things. And he will also denounce the lack of holiness among the nations. He will also uh, use a, a terminology that is used many times in Ezekiel, the word profane. The word profane and the word defile is something that is mentioned a lot. Actually, in chapter 44 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is talking to the priests and he is reproaching them of having not taught the people to discern between holiness and the profane. Make a difference what belongs to God and what belongs to the world. And this is the same thing today. When we come to church here, this church is a building, but actually it is not a building when we meet here in the name of Jesus Christ. When we come here and fellowship to meet God, it is no more a building. It is a holy temple. It is a place where the Holy Spirit dwells and works and brings the glory of God, transform lives. So it is a place of holiness. So for parents, for all of us as church members, when we enter the church and we come to fellowship, we must learn to discern what we are coming here to do. We must learn to discern the body of Christ. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul is kind of reproaching, rebuking the Christians, they are coming for communion. But he says, when you come for communion, it's not for be becoming better, it's for becoming worse. You have not discerned the body of Christ, he says. So this is possible for us to come physically into the house of the Lord and be completely out of tune with the, with what, with the method or the way that we should be coming here. With reverence, with respect, with, with a heart prepared for worship, with love, with acceptance, with recognitions of the body of Christ. So there are things we should leave out of the door. 
unwholesome words, divisions, uh, you know, like all of the little things that breaks fellowship in the church. This should not be allowed here because it becomes a holy place. God has accepted us. God has brought us here to, be, to grow and become one. So there is something holy here. There is healing. That is why we post the announcement. And please listen to me. I will make an announcement right now. When you enter the church after the opening song, stay in the back. Don't move among the chairs. Don't bring your noisy bag and pushing your way in the seats. Why? It's very simple. This has become a holy place where are some brothers and some sisters are trying to connect with God. They are trying to sing. They are trying to express something to God or maybe they are in need and they are going to teach. And when you break through the aisle and you, you make them open their eyes and you push them with your big bags and all of this, you are cutting off the holiness of God is trying to do here. That's why we ask people to stay in the back come. That, it's not because we want to be mean and we just want to punish you. That is not why. Being, you know, the pastors and we realize what is supposed to happen in a time of praise and worship. So it says, okay, if you are late, first of all, you're miss messing out. You're missing out on what God wants to do. Already there's something wrong if you are late, okay? Because you have not come in the respect of there is only one hour a week where we come as a church and unity to meet God. And we cannot even make it on time. So we are messing, missing out on that. So if you come late, at least don't disturb those who are, who are in the presence of God and connecting with God. Anyway, that's just a sideline. Okay. So 29 times... It says that they have profaned the holiness of God among the nations. They have profaned the land. They have profaned the Sabbath. They have profaned everything about God, the reputation, the holy name of God. And they talk 29 times about the word defile. So that becomes a very, very important theme. The prophet is concerned that God's people are not living in a way that they bring honor and glory to God. Instead, like Paul says in, in uh, Romans, he says, because of you, the name of the Lord is being blasphemed among the nation. So you see the message of Ezekiel in the Old Testament and the message of Paul in the New Testament and Romans are similar in nature and in content. When we don't live up according to the holiness of the Lord, and keeping up with the standards of God, something of, of the reputation of God. It's like we, we are connected, our lives is connected to the reputation of God. So that's why God wants to bring this transformation, that this message needs to be brought to us. Again, we come to the end of a year. Are there any areas of our life that have not honored the name of the holy the holy name or the the holiness of the great name of God this year is there something that we miss that we live lower than we ought to we come at the end of this year it's time to readjust and to refresh our life and that's the message of Ezekiel as well let's read Ezekiel 36 Son of man, when the house of Israel live in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman and her menstrual impurity. Ver chapter 24. Your impurity is your lewdness and the corruptions of your idolatry. I tried, look at what God is again trying to do. I tried to cleanse you, but you refused. So now you will remain in your field until my fury against you has been satisfied. I, the Lord, have spoken. The time has come and I won't hold back. I will not change my mind. You will be judged on the basis of all your wicked actions, says the Lord. This is a very serious word given here. We will be judged according to our actions. God has tried to cleanse us from our impurities. We have refused. We have been stubborn. We want to 
keep our lifestyle, our so-called freedom and everything, like our independence from the Lord. So God's, the Lord says, okay, I have tried, you have refused, keep your filth for yourself. And, and we need to realize that the problem of man, your problem, my problem, is a problem always with sin. From Genesis chapter 3 until the Lord will return, the, 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 the fight, the war, is about sin. Who's going to win? Satan has led us into sinning. And he is still coming back for more. Deceitful, uh, cunning, tempting us. Uh, leading us into rebellion, uh, lowering our standards, missing out on the, 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 uh, the concept of God, of His holiness. He is trying to bring us to our perdition. That's, that's the reality of each one of us today. The prophets knew it. The priests like Ezekiel that are by the Holy Spirit understood that. That's why their message is so clear. That's why their message is so strong. And in our generation, we have a very weak message. It's all about love. It's all about grace. It's all about cool. It's all about that God has become cool. But God is, is love. He is merciful. That's why He has worked a plan. And He is going to work it to the end. And the punishment and the captivity and the scattering of His people among the nation was part of his plan to remove that field, to change their heart, to bring them to the realization, you have profaned my name by your actions. I am going to take you somewhere where you will learn that lesson. So when you will come back, I love you, I will bring you back. And even God promised that even in the captivity, he was going to be with them. And he was going to help them. And he was going to protect them. And he was going to bring them back. And when they will be back, they will have known the greatest lesson. You are God. You are my God. And that is what is so important in Ezekiel. Ezekiel preached national repentance. Bring the nation back to God. But we all understand that repentance is an individual act. So another theme that is very important in the book of Ezekiel is individual responsibility of each one of us. Your life and my life is about connecting individually with God. And God will uh, consider us not as a group, not as lighthouse, not as your family, not as your nations, Christian or not, but about you and him. And that is what we learn in uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 and 33. This is a two parallel text that almost are identical in content. We read this, Ezekiel 33. And suppose some wicked person turn from their sins and do what is just and right, then they will surely live and not die. None of their past sins will be brought up again. That is in the context of individual responsibility. This person that we are reading about was a wicked person before. Now he is turning from his sin and now there's a transformation of heart, of mind, and now he's living just and right. That person will live. Go to the next verse. What happened when the opposite will will take place when righteous people turn from their righteous behavior and start doing sinful things they will die yes they will die because of their sinful deeds so it's the opposite exactly we will come back to that and and uh, chapter 33 verse 13 suppose i promise good people that they will live then later they start sinning and believe they will be saved by the good they did in the past. These people will certainly be put to death because of their sins, their good deeds will be forgotten. Here there's a very important concept and sometimes we might miss it and kind of confuse some ideas that let me, me, me share with you. First of all, when a person repent, turn to Jesus, 
I think this is, we know that, we understand that part, it's easy. Uh, God does not look to us from our past. It's not about our past anymore. We have been accepted, we have been forgiven, we have started a new life with Jesus. Our life is being turned around and God will not look, us, look to us as we were or mention what we have done in the past. As far as the east is from the west, it's as, as far as our sins are from us. I will remember your sins no more, God says somewhere else. So that's how, how powerful the forgiveness and the cleansing of God is to us. So here there's a small application for all of us in this room. If God does not look to our past, does not reproach us what we have done and what we have been, shouldn't we Christians to one another do the same thing? Because it's not always the case. Some of us have, are opening our lives, our secret dark things of the past to someone, and someone else will turn it against us and destroy our reputation to someone else, or judge us in a certain way. We should never do that as Christians. Because God doesn't do it for us. Whatever messed up life you've had, whatever horrible act you may have committed in the past, God is not going there anymore. He's not bringing it back. So as a church family, as a body of Christ, we should never do that. To, to go against the reputation of somebody. Or look at what they have been in the past. Did, did, did you know? Did, 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 did. This, this should be, this is holiness. This is the holy house of the Lord, the body of Christ. We're not here to take a friend, steal a friend from one for myself and destroy another one. We cannot allow each other to live in the flesh. The book of Ezekiel is about the Holy Spirit. Did you know that in this book there are 24 mentions of the Holy Spirit? Miraculous, supernatural, new heart, new spirit. And what God wants to do by the Holy Spirit is 24 in these 48 chapters. That is a lot of the Holy Spirit in this book. And so we need to live in the Spirit. And you know what is a problem for us? Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desire of the flesh because the flesh and the spirit's desire are an opposition. Either you go one way or you go the other way. So when you are not in the spirit, when we are not being renewed and refreshed and revived, that's why revival is important, that's what we are being in invited to do, we go back to the flesh. We speak with flesh, we act with flesh, we conduct ourselves with flesh, and then we, we hurt other people, we hurt ourselves, we hurt the reputation of God, we, the, the, the name of the Holy God is being defiled because we are using our flesh. And we like our flesh, isn't it? We feed our flesh. So here we are told that we should not be doing that. Number two, if God is forgiving us our past and not going back there, and we read that uh, um, w w w our sins are not going to, to be back, a sinner can become a saint, then let me ask you a question, can a saint become a sinner? And that is another thing that we need to be aware of. Beware of backsliding. Do you know any backslider? Have you met any Christians who are not Christians anymore? Or they maybe are still kind of believing with their head, but they are far from living the real life and the real intention of God. Do you know any people like that? People who are angry, disappointed, they, they like their freedom and things like that. So there is a warning here. The New Testament says, the wages of sin is death. That's New Testament. It seems that it comes from directly from the Old Testament. The wages of sin is death. So if this is not, if we are not living for Jesus Christ, 
the gift of God, eternal life and forgiveness, then the wages of sin is back. If we have sin, we have wages of sin. But here is what we fool ourselves with the concept. We stockpile our good deeds so that even though I live lower standards, I'm not really re living in holiness. I have been a Christian 10 years, 20 years. I, I am part of the choir. I, I, am, I am going to church. I still believe in God. I still read my Bible. But look at what it says here. Turn from the righteous behavior and start doing sinful things. What is the consequence of that? It says they will die for it. So, f but for us, we have some kind of a, this concept that I'm okay. I have given my life to Jesus in the past. So I am born again. I have been born again. So I, I'm okay. And then if we drift away, what's the reality of that? If we, it says, turn from righteous behavior, the right life of God, and start doing sinful things. We go back there. The devil tempt us. And we yield, and we go on with our lives, and we, we, we go back. What should God do with us? The wages of sin is death. So the only thing here that saves us again is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If you confess your sin, it's only through confession of sin, again, to go back always to our Savior, but not trying to think I have been a Christian long enough. I know everything about the Bible. I, I, you know, I've done so many things. I, I am a Christian. I am a Christian, so I'm okay. And then, then we lower our standards. Is that what it means? No. As soon as we, the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we need to confess so that He can cleanse, so that He can forgive. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So many in the time of Ezekiel ignore the warning of Ezekiel. But look at that. They still believed that they were okay. They still believed that they could go to God and ask His blessing and ask His promise. And one day they went to Ezekiel and said, Ezekiel, we're coming to you. We're seeking the Lord. We're seeking a word from the Lord. Speak to us. And Ezekiel received a word from the Lord. You think I am going to listen to you? I am not listening a word of you and I'm not speaking a word of you. This is what God answered to the people. So let us not deceive our, our mindset and lose sight of the holiness of God. Let's be serious with God. We, we cannot just stockpile righteousness and then live lower. We have to maintain the life that we have with God. And it is possible with the Holy Spirit. Amen? That is what the message of, of, this, of this book. Amen. Hallelujah. Repentance. Another truth in this book is that God doesn't want people to die. This is very clear. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 13 and 31. Therefore, I will judge each of you, O people of Israel, according to your own actions, says the Sovereign Lord. Repent, repent and turn from your sins. Don't let them destroy you. Don't let your sins, your bad habits, your addictions, your uh, mistakes, your failures, your excuses, your uh, whatever it is. If you, if, when we realize that we are not where we should be, immediately we should revive. Because otherwise, don't let these trends in your life, don't let these String away. Don't let these weaknesses, these temptations move you. Any, any. Don't harden your heart. Don't ignore these things. Don't let it destroy you. Put your, all your rebellion behind you and find yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Look for the, the spirit of God. Change your heart. Examine your heart. Keep your heart new. Keep your heart in love. Keep your heart. Like, you know, when you have a couple... So I, I think you have heard me say that before. There was this old man. He has been married for more than 40 years with his wife. And his wife told him, You never tell me that you love me. 
And he says, I told you I loved you the day I married you, and if I'm going to change my mind, I will tell you. <laughs> so it's the same with God. This is a relationship of individual person. We cannot just take for granted. It's, it's your love that needs to be refreshed. So seek for yourself a new heart, a renew, uh, 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 something new all the time. Why should you die, O people of Israel? I don't want you to die. That's clear. That's, that's God all the time. From Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, until he will come again in glory, I don't want you to die. What does he want? Turn back and live. Live the abundant life. Live with me. Enjoy the best life possible with God. You see, we have a choice in life. You can live without God, and you can live with God. And both of us groups will go through about more or less the same experience in life. We both get sick, we may have accidents, we can have good things and bad things happen to us. Whether you live for God or whether you live without God, there's a difference. One, you have God with you. The other one, you're on your own. You can choose what you want to live for. But me, I choose to live with God, even though some things not so good or pleasant may happen to me, but I have God with me. And this is part of the message of Ezekiel. You know, something very important happened in the book of Ezekiel, because at the beginning, before the, the, the captivity, the destruction of Jerusalem during these 10 years, uh, the message has been one of repentance. But there's a day in, in, in the book, in the chapter 33, a fugitive from Jerusalem come to them and announced that the city has been destroyed, it's been burned, everything, the walls are down, the temple is destroyed, everything's temple. You know what happened to Ezekiel on that day? Something really, really, this perspective change. The fall of Jerusalem marked an important transition in Ezekiel's prophecies. From that day on, instead of calling to repentance, he addressed the questions that they now have. We have no more city. We have no more temple. Where is our religion? Where is our God? What's going to happen to us? They have been now uh, scattered among all the nations. So all of these questions. So Ezekiel will change his message. And that's why Ezekiel, is a, this message is a message of hope. It's a message of restoration. It's a message of the future glory. God, and God is telling them, I'm working. And to this captivity, I'm with you. Y you can make money. You can buy homes, you can grow fruits, you can do everything. I will bring you back. And the message of Ezekiel becomes a message of hope. I will bring you back. And when I bring you back, you will think, you will remember your sins. You will remember the profanities every, everywhere you, you have not conducted yourself. And you will hate yourself for all the sins of the past. They will come to realize what sin is. What, son has, what sin has done to them and their relationship with them. That's what Ezekiel says. You will be changed from inside. I will change you. And then this is the message has been, has been changed. So Ezekiel is now answering questions. He's pouring hope into their life. He's telling them what God is going to do with them. He's not finished with them. And Roman, Paul says very clearly, God has not finished with his people, and one day all Israel will be saved. So that's the message of Romans, that's the message of Ezekiel. All Israel will be saved. So this, he has received a special mission. Israel will be restored by divine power. Ezekiel 36, verse 32. 23 to 25. This is another very essential truth about God's character. You know, many times we, in our modern concept of God and salvation, it's all about love, love. God is love, God is love, God is love. But let's learn something about the deeper side of God's holiness and righteousness and love. And in chapter 36, we are going to learn why 
God is restoring Israel, why God is bringing them back to himself, forgiving their sin and restoring them. We will learn something. I will show how holy my great name is. The name on which you brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their eyes, the nations, says the Sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. The work that God is doing to Israel is a testimony of God to the world. It was impossible that Israel became a nation in 1948. They had been scattered for so many, so many years, and Israel has become a nation. It doesn't mean that what the politics that of Israel are okay, and we can accept everything, that the, the, the horrors or the cruelties or the injustice that Israel is doing today. That's not what we're saying. We are saying that God has chosen this nation through Abraham. He has made promises that through this nation, the Messiah would come, the Savior would come. He has a plan that he will keep them all along. He will correct them, he will punish them, he will do anything that he needs to do. But he will complete and he will fulfill his plan for them. And this is what he's saying. He is doing it for his great name. What God is doing in this world is for his great name. When God has saved you, it's for his great name. Paul says it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that when God saved me, the blasphemer that I was, the, the, the violent man that I was, he, he is using my testimony of my uh, changed life as a, as a testimony to, to the honor, to his patience, to his greatness, to his great name. So when you are saved, you are a testimony God is powerful. God has changed you. God has a plan for you. And God does it for individuals, and God does it for nations and groups of people. He does it. He starts with one person in the family, then he will save the brother, the sisters, the mother, the father, and then we, we go on, we go on with that. So God says, I will show how holy my great name. You, by your sinfulness, have profaned. You have, you have shamed my name. I'm going to restore my great name, my, the holiness of my great name through you, says the Lord. I will gather you from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. Remember before he says, I tried to cleanse you, you refuse, so now your filth will remain with you. So later on, God says, I'm sprinkling water on you. You will have no more filth on you. Your filth will be washed away. The very first thing to learn about God is the, about essential about his character. Why is he bringing his people back? It's not only because love, 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 love. It's deeper than that. Yes, love is also part of it. It is to show how holy my great name is on which you brought shame and to reveal my holiness through you. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord. And uh, this is very, very important. Second time, second thing, cleansing is necessary. And it is the Lord who is doing the cleansing. And it is referring to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. When he will come, he will save us from our sin. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rule. Cleansing or forgiveness comes first. But then the work of the Holy Spirit comes next and it changes our old heart of flesh and stone and bring us a new heart, a heart that will be obedient to the Lord, a heart that will desire God, a heart that will restore the relationship with God. Hallelujah. And this is also uh, according to the New Testament. If you look to the second verse, the, I mean the click here, Titus chapter 3, we read exactly what I'm talking about. We have been saved according to His mercy. He did not treat us as we deserve by the washing of regeneration, the sprinkling. I will sprinkle and I will remove your filth. 
and the renewing by the Holy Spirit that he has brought on us through Jesus Christ so that by his grace we might be put right with God and live the life, the eternal life that he has given to us. So the message of Ezekiel is a message of hope. I am working in your life and even though you, you, you are messing up with your life, I am restoring you because I am giving to you my Holy Spirit. And this is what we need in the beginning of 2016. At this time, we need to examine where I am standing with the Lord. Is it my flesh or is that my spirit? Am I in holiness or am I walking in my own strength? Am I honoring God or am I not really honoring God? Are there areas of my life that need to change? God says, listen, I will give you my Holy Spirit and I will change your heart of flesh. In another chapter, we see that the, the, the expression about the new heart is, is, is repeated many times. I will give you singleness of heart, single mind, a wholehearted f to follow God and put a new spirit with them. I will take their stony heart, their stubborn heart, and give them a tender, responsive heart sensitive so that they will obey. That's what God is after. Your problem and my problem is always sin. It's always connected to sin. And my victory and my success is always the Holy Spirit. It's never me. It's always been like this. It will always be like that. And when I am not walking in dependence and being refilled and renewed by the Holy Spirit, then my old flesh comes back. The natural me comes back. Then something will go wrong. Now this, but the Lord is giving us a message of hope. A message to start all over again. Sprinkling water is available. New heart is available. New spirit, new power is available. And the plan that he has for us is so wonderful. And I finish with the last slide just to bring you a, a bit of what is coming ahead. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is in Revelation, this is in Ezekiel, this is in Corinthian, this is all over. This is the plan of God from the beginning to the end. This is, He wants you, He wants your heart, and He wants you forever. You will be my people, that will be your God. Next, the Lord took all of me and I was carried away by the Spirit to a valley filled with bones. This is another great chapter that we don't have to look. And this is uh, illustrations of the impossibility of the nation of Israel to be restored. They were carried in every nation. They were destroyed. There are no more temple. There are no more city. There are no more army. There are no anything. And he said to me, son, can these bones live? Is there something in your life that you are discouraged this morning? That you think you have been too far? That you, something is wrong with your past? Something is that you have done this last year or, or in the past? Can these bones live? And this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. And this is the constant reminder of God to us. The message of Ezekiel is so relevant for us today. Next. Ezekiel 37, a bit later, I will make my home among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And when my temple is among them forever, the nations will know that I am the Lord who makes Israel holy. And the same thing for you as an individual. When God makes you holy, the nations or people will know and recognize that the Lord is powerful. He can change you. He can save you. He can keep you. Next. And from that day, this is so, so encouraging. And from that day, this is the last verse of Ezekiel, the very, very last verse, the last words of Ezekiel. And from that day, the name of the city will be, the Lord is there. Wow. The Lord is there in your office. The Lord is there in your home. When you eat dinner at home, when you are with your children, you tell them a bedtime story. When you come to church, anytime you are, 
wherever you are, the Holy Spirit and you makes that the Lord is there. That's the name of the city. That's what describes your life. That's what describes the intention of God for, for all of us. The message of the prophet is for us today. A message of hope. A message of restoration. A message for ending 2015 and to 2016. Amen? Let, let's, let's stand, please. Hallelujah.